have I come at a bad time? On the contrary, you were afraid you weren't coming at all. What's the matter? The Hatter's the matter. Or the matter of the Hatter. The former. No, the latter. Mm. <laughs> Tweedles. I Hi folks, I'm Ignati Vishnevetsky. And I'm Alex Dowd. We're here this week at Farmhouse Tavern, just around the corner from the AV Club office. Welcome to Film Club. Alice Through the Looking Glass is not a good film. Oh, that's putting it kindly, I would say. <laughs> so this is a sequel to Tim Burton's little loved but very commercially successful loose adaptation of Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. When a film makes a billion dollars worldwide, a sequel is inevitable. But yeah, I mean, even for somebody who really did not much care for Burton's version of Alice in Wonderland, I was shocked at just how empty this sequel is. It really doubles down on, for me, the least appealing aspect of Burton's film, which was that it takes the sort of fundamentally irrational qualities of Lewis Carroll and applies this sort of hero's journey self-actualization narrative. On yeah, top and, of it. and here it's basically an origin story for all of yes, the characters. Another origin story. <laughs> yes. Do you want to see the Mad Hatter make his first hat? Because you do in this film. <laughs> You gotta go bigger for the sequel, right? You've already got a really, really bad Johnny Depp in the original film. The way you outdo it is you put Sasha Baron Cohen in the next film doing an Austrian accent. There's a scene where the Sasha Baron Cohen character comes to tea with a Mad Hatter. And to me, it's like the De Niro Pacino moment in <laughs> Heat. They're just sitting at a table. They're just doing their crazy accents at each other while surrounded by CGI animals. The plot of this thing, if it must be discussed, <laughs> basically involves Alice returning to Wonderland. She's played by Mia Vashikovska. Right. Always cast as a 19th century literary <laughs> heroine. She's yeah. got that pre-Raphaelite look. So she returns to Wonderland and discovers that the Mad Hatter has been stricken with this incurable sense of ennui because his family was killed by the Jabberwocky and she has to go back in time. And the film's only real addition to the environmental vocabulary of the original is this time layer, this kingdom of clocks. And it, Which I looks just exactly like if I told you, time layer, there are clocks hanging from the ceilings. It's like pocket watches hanging <laughs> from strings. There's some yeah. hallways. <laughs> it's funny, this is, this is a series that is always championing imagination that has very little. M most of the, the sort of visual ideas of the first film have been sort of reproduced here. But without the same, I think Burton, you know, he's thought of as this production design kind of stylist, right? And he didn't direct this, but he did yes. He did produce this. So he yeah. does yeah, sort of have James a hand. James Bobbin, who made Muppets Most Wanted. Wanted, doing sort of a flat imitation, largely of Burton's style. I mean, the movie can't even properly introduce Wonderland. I think it assumes that its audience is just so familiar with this place it's and has seen the original. Sort of Paul she drops Paul's into down. Wonderland, and there's no moment of, oh yeah, this is this is this wondrous, amazing place of imagination. It's really the Batman v Superman of Lewis Carroll adaptations because <laughs> yeah, exactly. you just plunge straight in there. You just yeah. expect to know who all of these people are. I would say the movie lost me the first time you see the Mad Hatter in the film, which is in a flat flashback sequence and there's Depp prancing and skipping <laughs> toward the camera. Yeah. Oh man. I mean, I think it's been overstated over the years how much Depp sort of lets his costume designers and lets his makeup do the acting for him. Depp is bringing something to the table usually, but I just can't understand what thought process went into the conception of this character. I think the best parts of this film are the ones where no one is talking. And there are some visual details that I think are interesting. I think some of Time's little wind-up assistants are Those sort of- Those all derivative me. to me. They're I felt derivative, like I've seen yeah. them in other movies, you know? Yeah. You feel like this is just like very poor Tim Burton adaptation. Yeah. Because I don't feel like it's as derivative of him as it is of a whole lot of other- Certainly narratively, it doesn't owe that much to, to Burton's films. Mm -hmm. It's just, I think, another assembly line origin story. Well, we ended up talking about this on the way back, but you said uh, as far as Burton's actual work that you hadn't completely enjoyed a Burton movie since Mars Attacks. I mean, I think that's the last Burton that really, really worked for me. So you weren't that big on Sweeney Todd. I actually, I would agree that is one of his better ones in the last 20 years. If I have any objection to that film, I feel like that just works better on stage than it does as a film. There are elements of, of Sleepy Howl I liked a lot. Certainly from a production design standpoint, that one is And you know I'm a defender of the Planet of the Apes opening credits sequence. <laughs> yes. And well, I, I rewatched that recently and it is wonderful, especially because we don't really have elaborate credit sequences anymore. The opening of that movie promises such a much better film. So you like Big Fish. I like parts of Big Fish. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very sentimental. I find it aggressively sentimental. Yeah. Also kind of dishonest in a way because it presents a guy who's been lying to his family for their entire lives as this romantic hero. I, I feel like the quote unquote more realistic Burtons, I think with the exception of Ed Wood, have some kind of 
problem at the level of conception yeah. or how they're structured. Like, there's so many things I liked about Big Eyes. Like, I like how weird Christoph Waltz's performance is. Like, I mean, and it's and so and artificial, but it helps because it makes it, it this character he's... comes off as fake right away. Exactly. Uh, I remember watching that and thinking, this is either a great performance or an awful one, and maybe it doesn't matter which it is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that it works for this film. Well, because the performances in his films, I think, are something that gets overlooked. I think, with the exception of Alice in Wonderland, I think Depp is generally pretty damn good in his movies. I mean, I think that the rap against Burton's modern stuff is that he's ceded all of his wonderment duties to his art department. And he's always been a filmmaker who has leaned heavily on that aspect of filmmaking. Mm. But something about the way that films are made today has sort of relinquished his responsibility in generating these worlds, if I you know mean, what I mean. It's true. You know, I keep thinking of the environments of Batman Returns and of how if it wouldn't take the same effort to create that weird kind of fascist slash gothic vision of a city. For me, that's kind of a fundamental question is, so why do we look at Burton's early stuff and see so much imagination, and why do those things work? Where his newer stuff, which is so CGI abetted, and yeah, why he doesn't can, that work? He, and he, where he can do anything. I think maybe because sometimes it shows too much. Mm -hmm. Maybe when you do show the entire CGI cityscape or landscape and you're swooping through it, you're not engaging the viewer's imagination in the same way. You know, as a kid watching Batman Returns or Batman, it's the parts of the city you can't really make out right. that sort of engage your imagination. It's the fact that you get these sets that suggest buildings that just keep going sure. up and up and up and you're just seeing what you can see from the ground. That engages your imagination. Part of me wonders though if, if this is partially just that we're older now. I mean, we're talking about films from our childhood. For me, these were really, really formative movies. Beetlejuice I'm, especially for me. I think it's one of his best and I also think it's the one that I think of when somebody says Tim Burton. But I wonder how much is there a new generation of kids who look at something like Alice in Wonderland and have the same kind of reaction to that as we had to the Batman films. Or God, I hope not. I know, I hope not too. <laughs>